there, and then we'll get stuck into uh, this next part of Matthew uh, as we're working our way through it and uh, try and make some sense of that uh, for us this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, thanks that we can get together this morning. Uh, we do thank you for the rain and the refreshment that it brings. Father, we thank you for your word and the refreshment that it brings to our hearts. Uh, please help us to understand it. Please change us in heart and mind that we might respond rightly to the Lord Jesus and glorify you in all we do. Amen. Well, Joe Biden and Donald Trump uh, got together in front of cameras uh, to have their second presidential debate the other night, uh, trying to convince the US people that they are worthy to lead the nation for the next four years. Uh, I didn't see much, of, much coverage of it, but I suspect it wasn't so much trying to convince them that I'm the right person to lead you, but that that bloke over there is not the right person uh, on all the negatives. Uh, but it was trying to get the point. Uh, there was a confrontation between the two and a choice needs to be made. And, and this section of Matthew's gospel, actually right from chapter 8 through to chapter 10, is like a big debate raging. It's not one-on-one, -on -one, though, in many respects. Uh, the one-on-one, -on -one, it's Jesus versus the world. Uh, but the world has a whole lot of players. So it's Jesus versus demons, demon, Jesus versus disease, Jesus against storms, Jesus against, Jesus against. It's, it's a bit more like Bear Grylls, man versus wild. One challenge after another after another. The first four verses of Matthew 8 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, Jesus versus leprosy, healed, Jesus wins. Jesus versus the unbreakable Old Testament law, will he break it or uphold it? Jesus upholds it, keeps the law. Jesus versus paralysis, Jesus heals the paralysis. And he not only did he heal the paralysis, he healed the paralysis and he wasn't even in the same postcode. He just said by his word, be healed, and the person was healed. He'd never even met the person. Jesus wins. Uh, it's Jesus' hands in the air. And the post-confrontation, uh, post-debate interview, post-round interview, uh, at the end of, uh, in verses... 11 and 12, Jesus promises, you put your faith in me and there's a place at God's table for you. Don't trust me, you'll be locked out. You'll be cast into darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Very stark contrast. And, and here in the bit that Ron read, just read to us, uh, Matthew wraps up the examples uh, to make the point, his point about the authority of Jesus over sickness and demons. And it's signaling why you should come to Jesus and why you should put your trust in him. And it gives us who have done that an idea, it gives everybody really an idea of what we ought to expect from Jesus today and how we ought to be responding to him. Uh, so let's, first of all, let's look at the action. We got the slides there, Tony? They're on the desktop. Uh, Jesus, verse 14, he goes to Peter's house. Uh, all happens very quickly. Jesus saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Jesus versus fever, it's over before you can bat an eyelid. The nature of her illness, it's not clear, but what is clear, at Jesus' touch, the fever's gone. And verse 15, what does it say? She then got up and began to wait on him. Instant and effective is the healing. Not a steady recuperation. That's what you expect from a fever, isn't it? If you've got a fever on, on Friday, 
touch and go, whether you might make it on Sunday. But instant and effective, touched, healed. Who wants a doctor like that? Yeah, it'd be good, wouldn't it? Jesus only needs to exercise his authority and the deed is done, the healing is done. Now, the sceptic might think, wow, lucky timing, hey. Just as mum was about to get up out of bed after being in bed for a week, Jesus rocked up and touched her. Maybe, but verse 16, have a look at that. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. Jesus versus demons, Jesus versus sickness, no contest. Again and again and again, sickness after sickness, spirit after spirit, Jesus wins. Last night, I sat down and watched the AFL Grand Final. Uh, Richmond beat Geelong. Uh, probably most of you don't care, and probably some of you are going, does Richmond just up the road have an AFL football team? Uh, it's the one in, one in Melbourne. Uh, they're a bunch of lunatic supporters, uh, very passionate. There's a guy that plays for Richmond called Dustin Martin. Uh, he won the Man of the Match Award again. Third time he's won the man of the match in the grand final. Pretty impressive, isn't it? One to play three grand finals, let alone win the man of... He's de- he is in legend status. And last night further confirmed his standing among the greats of the AFL. What about Jesus here? He wins the confrontation with the demons possessed and the sick again and again and again. It's clear cut. Now, Dustin Martin got voted best on ground or man of the match at each of those. Some questions, and it's a matter of opinion about whether he's best. No question here with Jesus. It's clear cut. The result is plain. Then when we go to verse 17, it tells us uh, a bit more about what was taking place. A bit of a helps us with a bit of an explanation. Jesus' healings and exorcism, verse 17 say, were to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now to understand the significance of Jesus in action, to really fill it out, it's really helpful to go back and see what the prophet was saying. Uh, see, who, who else watched the AFL Grand Final? It's not bad. Uh, who's been wasting lots of time during the year watching the AFL? Right? There's a few of us that, no offence to everyone else, we understand the significance much more of Dustin Martin than the rest of you because we've watched it, viewed it, and we're into it. Uh, To understand the significance of that line about he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases, you need to go back to Isaiah. You need to fill in the background. Isaiah was a prophet who spoke 800 years earlier. What's 800 years earlier look like? I remember, have you seen Robin Hood? Robin Hood was about 800 years ago, King John of England. Uh, Genghis Khan, 800 years ago. All right? So we're talking that, that, that long ago, that's Isaiah making the prophecy about Jesus. So what did uh, the prophet have to say? Well, Isaiah was a really well-known prophet. Uh, his prophecy, his, the book with his name is one of the largest in the Old Testament. And in the last third of Isaiah's prophecy, there's a series of songs We call them the servant songs because there's a servant who is the subject of all of these songs. Uh, And so they're about this servant that would come. The servant was described as God's king who would reign forever. And in the song that these words here in Matthew 8 come from, the servant is described as a sacrifice and as a substitute 
that he would switch himself in in place of his people and he would sacrifice himself, he would give his life to save his people who have been substituted out. Uh, here are some of the lines of that song. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. Now, in the New Testament, writers keep picking up this song. And when they're picking it up, they're always connecting it to the cross, to Jesus' death. Uh, Matthew himself does it three times. In chapter 20, uh, Matthew does it. He says, uh, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In chapter 27, when it's talking about Jesus dying, when he's on trial, uh, Matthew speaks about how Jesus remains silent. This servant song speaks about the servant being led like a lamb to the slaughter and how he was silent as he was led there. And later on when in Matthew 27, when it's talking about where Jesus would be buried after being crucified, again the words of this song in Isaiah are playing out. The song says that the servant would die like all people but would be buried among the rich. And it was a rich man in Jesus' day who gave his own tomb for Jesus to be buried in. Now, back to Matthew 8. All right. When you're looking at the background, Isaiah's servant song, Jesus is the servant who dies in the place of his people as a substitute, and the whole purpose is to restore them to God. Matthew here, in the bit we've read this morning, links Jesus links it to Jesus' healing ministry, not to his death. So why does Matthew do that? Well, what we need to realise, when we think about sickness, what do we normally think about? We hear sickness, we think medical condition. The Bible actually takes us a step further. The Bible teaches us that sickness is because of something deeper than a medical condition. Sickness is caused by sin. Just notice the extra couple of words up there, directly or indirectly by sin. Uh, underneath the, the medical causes for sin, uh, medical causes of our sickness is sin. Okay? Most sickness is not the direct result of a specific sin, but sickness reflects the truth that all of us live this side of the fall, live, live this side of a broken relationship, live in a broken relationship with God. We live in the era of sin. We are all destined to die. This is the curse of sin. It's a condition that we all have. Sickness has and will continue to plague humanity. And it will happen until the final coming of Jesus when his kingdom will be fully established. Uh, we're told in his kingdom there will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. And don't we long for that day? The curse of sin will be overthrown. The, co the condition of sin will be cured. So uh, just general uh, thinking about sickness. Sickness is the result of the condition of sinfulness. We're all sinful, but only some sickness is the direct result or the immediate impact of a specific sin. But when we are confronted with sickness, it should be one of those moments that causes us to stop and think, what is God's big plan? Where does this fit in the big picture? And to remember Jesus' confrontation with the world, Jesus' confrontation with demons, 
and sickness and that he conquered it. The second thing just with sickness is some sickness in the Bible is healed and some is not. Uh, You may hear people suggesting today that God cannot, does not, will not heal miraculously in today's day and age. The Bible doesn't support that claim. On the other side, you might hear people suggesting God will definitely heal you if you have enough faith. The Bible doesn't support that either. The God who allowed James to be killed by Herod while providing an escape for Peter is the God who arranged for the Apostle Paul to be ill while granting uh, one of the uh, followers of Jesus Dorcas life. Sickness in the big picture, we need to keep connecting back to the underlying problem, which is sin. And remember, there's only one remedy. It's Jesus' return at the end of the age. That is the only time when, sin, when sickness will be done away with. So why does Matthew refer to these lines of Isaiah's song? Let's tie together Jesus' actions and the prophet's words. All right, so we can work out what do we expect from Jesus today and how should we respond to his authority to heal. Um, Healing miracles are not simply Jesus flexing his muscles. They're signposts pointing forward to his death, the death that deals with the cause behind sickness, which is sin. Right back at the start of Matthew's gospel, uh, the angels come and speak to Joseph and Mary. One of the things that they told them, this child will save his people from their sins. In a couple of weeks' time, we'll see Jesus uh, heal, and not only that he have the authority to heal, but that he has the authority to forgive sins and therefore restore that relationship between uh, us and God. See, it's Jesus' death uh, that, that kicks off that restoration, that he inaugurates the new covenant, the new era that deals with sin. The ultimate undoing of sin will see the end of illness. It will come in the consummated, the the, the fullness of the kingdom of Jesus when he returns. So Isaiah 53, that song of the servant, tells us the servant will bear our suffering, bear our sickness. He will carry our infirmities. That's the context we need to keep reading this in, seeing the connection between sin and sickness, sin and demons, that the way the servant bears the sickness of us is through his suffering and death. Sin's the focus, but in dealing with sin, he deals with these other problems as well. And so you have this time in Matthew 8 where it's sort of leading up, building up to the coming in of the kingdom of Jesus. On Melbourne Cup Day, which is the second Tuesday in November, it also happens to be something else that takes place every four years, which uh, further pushes forward the coming in of a kingdom, so to speak. It's election day in America. And the Americans, if they turn out to vote, will vote and elect the next president. And the next presidency will really start from that day. It will be coming in. They'll be making arrangements, making plans. And then on the 20th of January, it happens every four years on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., there's a ceremony called the Inauguration the official marking of the beginning of the next presidency of the United States. Jesus' earthly ministry, what we see in Matthew 8, is the beginning of the inauguration of his kingdom. At the cross, it's like the inauguration ceremony. 
taking place. But his earthly ministry is the building up to that day. The healings, the exorcisms, the, the dealing with sickness and spirits and demons is anticipating that great day. And not just that day, but the rain that will follow, ultimately to his return again, when for God's people, sickness and demonic power will be removed forever. But because those brilliant benefits will only come about through Jesus' death, we need to understand the healings as pointing forward, but beyond the authority of just that act itself, but pointing forward to that atoning death of Jesus, that, that death that deals with sin so he can be restored to be at one with God again. So the healings of Matthew 8 are signs of Jesus' authority. So when uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law in verses 14 and 15, the centurion's servant and the leper in, in the first 13 verses of chapter 8 and all those other unnamed people in verse 16, it wasn't just Jesus flexing his muscles. It was pointing to his willingness to act as the atoning sacrifice as the one who would bear the penalty for sin and once and for all do away with our sickness and suffering, the sickness of sin. It's anticipating him going to the cross. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. <clears throat> so four points to think about as we take away from the passage. Uh, Christians shouldn't think of the benefits we have in Christ apart from thinking about Jesus' atoning death. We've got to come back to the cross. As you read the New Testament, all the things, all the part of the Bible written after the death and resurrection of Jesus, it keeps going back to the cross. So the Gospels, they're moving towards Jesus' death and resurrection, the ransom for many, the forgiveness of sins. All the epistles, all the letters, they presuppose, they take you back to the cross, the atonement. They talk about the new life that we have now at one with God in anticipation of the fullness of his kingdom. Even the gift of his Holy Spirit, God's presence with us, the guarantee of the, the promised inheritance. Why we've been granted, we've been given the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' triumph on the cross and his return to the Father's side. So when you read these powerful, these authoritative, these transforming acts of Jesus, and whether you hear about what's written in the Bible or people speaking about things happening today, always connect it back to his work on the cross and the coming of his kingdom. The second thing, declare confidently Jesus heals. Expect Jesus to heal, but define your terms. Uh, Jesus heals is one of those phrases that is butchered terribly. Uh, you have those that insist, and I've already mentioned this uh, briefly, Christians can expect that they can claim Jesus' healing today. They'd argue the atonement has been made, Jesus has died, victory is ours, the benefits provided. If you're not healed, the issue isn't the fault of Jesus. It's you haven't lodged your request form properly. You haven't come with sufficient faith and trust. That's why you're not healed. But it's not going back to the cross. It's not what the scriptures say. Uh, yeah, also, as I mentioned earlier, you have those on the other side that say there's no healing today. Healing is only provided at the consummation when Jesus' reign fully kicks in. You know what? All these healings are signposts to the cross. Jesus does heal. But his healing is ultimately through the cross healing our relationship with God. Some of those benefits of his kingdom happen now. 
with those sort of physical sickness, demon possession healings. Generally, we're waiting for them. Our healing is a benefit secured by the cross. Occasionally we see it now, but it's a promised benefit of the new heaven and the new earth. If in God's mercy he grants healing now, whether by what we consider normal means like Panadol or penicillin or miraculous means, we, be, we need to be grateful and thankful but we have no right to claim that benefit now simply because it's already secured eternally in Christ. The third thing, at death, Jesus' healing of sin at the cross is all that matters. When people get to the day of their death, that is all that matters. Uh, in and around us, Today in our world, there's lots of talk and lots of fundraising efforts towards medical research. By all means, get involved. Our love for people ought to drive us to those sorts of things. God's a God of order. Because of the order that he's created, we can study, we can research, we can predict, we can create solutions. It's right to pursue those things. But... Remember, healings are a signpost to the cross. Sin, not the sickness, is the real disease. Medical research, fundraising efforts are a secondary loving. In 1988, my father went to the doctor, went to the GP, he was having heart issues. Uh, one of the things uh, that he was told to do was to take that pack of cigarettes and throw them in the bin right now. That was loving, wasn't it? But if that was all that was done, if the blockages that were causing the problems weren't dealt with, what's the point in throwing the cigarettes away? See, whatever disease we get, whatever disease we might get on top of as a humanity, death remains. And the only solution at death is faith in Christ, the one who gave himself in our place, the one who rose again from the dead and offers us healing eternally because he died on the cross bearing our sins. At death, only Jesus' death matters. And he invites us now to turn to him. And the final thing I want to say, let's make great decisions. The first great decision is turn to Jesus. Uh, the second, th then the rest of the great decisions are what do we do in the meantime? What do we do between now and Jesus' return while we live, waiting for the fullness of his kingdom. Make great decisions. Uh, we live in crazy times. They're not cra the, the crazy times have happened before. I'm going to read you three quotes from someone that lived uh, in a crazy time in, uh, in the 1500s. Uh, in the early, I think it was in the late 1400s, half of Europe had died from the Black Plague. In 1527, the Black Plague struck again in Germany. There was a guy called Martin Luther. Many of you would have heard of him. Uh, he was living in the area where it came to and ministering the gospel there. Uh, here are some of the things he wrote. The first thing he said in terms of making great decisions, he said, help others. No one should dare leave his neighbour, Luther wrote, unless there are others who will take care of the sick in their, in their place and nurse them. In such cases, we must respect the words of Christ where he spoke about caring for those in my name. 
According to the passage, we're bound to each other in such a way that no one may forsake the other in distress, but is obliged to assist and help them as he himself would like to be helped. Make great decisions. Help others. But he also went on and said, while you're making great decisions to help others, make great decisions to protect others, to protect each other. He wrote, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me. And I've done what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbour needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but I will go freely. Make great decisions. Help others. Protect others. One last word from Luther. If Christ shed his blood for me and died for me, why should I not expose myself to some small dangers for his sake and disregard this feeble plague? If you can terrorise, Christ can strengthen me. If you can kill, Christ can give life. If you have poison in your fangs, Christ has far greater medicine. The greatest decision is to put your trust in Jesus. He secures our health at the cross and he secures it for all eternity because our root sickness is sin. Death will come to us. Those who trust in Jesus now will pass through death because of Jesus, the servant, because of his death in our place and his rising to new life. So don't let the fear of demons, spirits, sickness, disease, don't let that scare you into withdrawing your touch from other people's lives. As Christians, as people reading the Bible, we know that sickness and disease and demons are signposts to the victory of Christ over sin and death. And we need to remind each other of that and we need to explain those signs to others. Make great decisions. Help others. Protect others. Point them to the cross. There's no greater disease to be healed from than sin. And Jesus heals those who come to him. He heals their sin disease. He heals the sin disease of all who come to him. And he does it through his death on the cross as the servant who suffered and sacrificed his life to bear the penalty for sin that we deserve so that we might have peace with God and be healed forevermore. Amen. Thanks, Adam. We've uh, heard a great.